Hey guys, welcome to Hip Hughes History. We're doing it. We're doing the 1948 presidential election. Do we wins? Psych. This is one for the presses, guys. Let's take a look at the candidates. Let's take a look at the major issues. Then we'll break it down and we'll giddy up for the learning. All right, guys, let's get her done right now. All right, we got a new color on the board this time, guys. How exciting. We got a little bit of the orange for Strom Thurmond and the Dixiecrats. But this election is going to be won by the Democrats. It's an upset election for the incumbent Harry Truman. Harry Truman's going to carry the day with 303 electoral votes. The Republicans are going to renominate Thomas E. Dewey, the very successful um, progressive Republican from New York. He's going to end up with 189 electoral votes. But the Dixiecrats are going to accumulate 39 electoral votes by racking up four southern states, and we're going to talk about that. And we also have Henry Wallace, who is running as a progressive Democrat, who's going to uh, rack up zero electoral votes, even though his popular vote total matched that of Strom Thurmond and the Dixiecrats. We'll get all into it, but this is a great election if you're studying de-alignment, which basically means that there are some groups that are starting to suck away from the Democratic Party down in the solid South. So here we go, guys. Let's take a look at the candidates. We'll take a look at the issues. We'll take a look at the election results and then do some analysis. And we'll do it right now. So let's start with Harry Truman, who's going to be the Democratic nominee. And it wasn't really certain he was going to be the Democratic nominee, even though he was the incumbent president. Remember, Harry Truman wasn't really elected to the presidency. He was FDR's vice president, and he's going to take the reins in 1945 when FDR is going to move on to a different spiritual plane. But by 1948, he's really unpopular in the beginning of 1948. We haven't had the Berlin airlift. The economy hasn't rebounded. We have a lot of post-World War II problems. The world's a little bit in the dizzy with the UN and what's going on. And his popularity was really low, his approval rating well under the 40% mark. So a lot of political scientists, and including some in the inner circle of Harry Truman, didn't think it was a good idea for him, or him to run. And there was actually a party push to get Dwight Eisenhower to run as a Democrat. And if that had happened, and MacArthur, the other general, was nominated for the Republican Party, Harry Truman talked about running as Eisenhower's vice president. But that's not going to happen. He's going to have a couple challenges, but he's going to win the day, and he's going to run a feisty campaign. His slogan, you know, give him hell, Harry. He's going to run not so much against the Republican Thomas Dewey, who we're going to talk about in a second, whose policies were actually sometimes a little bit more progressive than the Democratic policies when it came to the New Deal and expanding Social Security and um, funding for education on the federal level and some type of health program. That was Thomas Dewey's platform. But what he is going to do, Harry Truman, is he's going to run against what he calls the do-nothing 80th Congress. And this is the Republican Congress that was elected in a landslide victory, taking control of the House and the Senate in 1946. So Harry's going to go on a whirlwind tour of the United States, and he is going to run against that Congress rather than running against the platform of Thomas Dewey. Now, one of his huge problems is going to be civil rights, and he made a calculated decision that he was going to support a very strong liberal civil rights platform at the Democratic nomination, which was actually led by Hubert Humphrey, who was going to be back in the 1950s. Harry Truman's original civil rights pledge was really more in line with constitutional language, trying to be a little bit of, a, of an appeaser towards those Southern Democrats and segregationalists. But at the end, he's going to make the calculation that he's going to risk that solid South. He's going to risk it for the numbers that he's going to get in those northern cities for African-American votes, whether it's New York or Chicago or Philly or Cleveland. These are swing states back then. So he adopts that plank at the convention. And about 36 Southern Democrats walk out, led by a few different governors of the South, but one of them was South Carolina Governor Strom Thurmond. And he's going to say, you know what? We can't win the presidential election with our small group, but we sure can be monkeys in the hen house. Monkeys in the hen house. I have no idea what that means. So they form a separate party, which we'll take a look at it in a second, called the Dixiecrats. So they're pulling away from the Democratic Party. That's that de-alignment that I'm talking about. Those are the days of that solid South, which are going to be no more for the Democratic Party. And then he has another problem to his left. You got a problem to your right, you got a problem to your left. Harry Truman is also going to have to deal with Henry Wallace. Remember that Harry Truman replaced Henry Wallace on the ticket in 1944 for FDR. Henry Wallace was seen by many of the 
more conservative members of the Democratic Party of being a little bit too out there, a little bit too more liberal, a little bit too more associated with like, true racial civil rights. And some people even called him aligned with the communists. And this guy had a lot of problems. We'll talk about him in a second. So most political scientists, and even Harry Truman himself, <laughs> are looking at the numbers and it's not looking that good. The Democratic vote is gonna get split up three ways and the Republicans are gonna look a little bit more unified. Let's take a look at Thomas E. Dewey right now. So the Republicans have their own fight for the nomination. It's going to end up going to the more progressive part of the Republican Party, renominating Thomas E. Dewey, who was just elected in a huge landslide re-election campaign in New York for their governorship. But he does get some push from the left and the right in his party. Harold Statson, who was the governor of Minnesota and was more progressive than Thomas E. Dewey, challenged him for the nomination, as did Taft, a much more conservative Republican from Ohio. Remember, this is the son of William Howard Taft. And we we also have draft campaigns coming from the grassroots levels, first for Dwight Eisenhower. The Democrats and the Republicans wanted Ike, but Ike's not going to run. And then there was a push to get General Douglas MacArthur, you know, who's the Japanese Supreme Commander for the Allies over there controlling Japan, um, but he's not going to be able to pick up the nomination. It actually ends up being a race between the more progressive members, who of course are Thomas Dewey and Harold Stetson. And this is actually the first radio debate in the history of presidential politics, right before the Oregon primary in May of 1948, they go on the radio in Oregon kind of battling each other, and it's actually about the legality of the Communist Party. And Statson, who was more liberal, actually said, we should ban the Communist Party. And it was Thomas E. Dewey with the famous line, you can't shoot an idea, that actually takes that debate. He wins the Oregon primary, and that launches him you know, into the nomination and getting that nomination. So Thomas E. Dewey is way ahead in the polls. Gallup, you know, all the way up, I think, to was September, had him, you know, double digits, like 15 points ahead of Harry Truman. So he's running a very calculated, ambiguous campaign. One of his famous slogans was, our future lies ahead of us. Yeah, well, duh. But he wouldn't take hard stances on containment and the Cold War, what was going on, or the economy and what exactly he would do. And even though a lot of his positions in his platform were very progressive, he wouldn't talk about them on the campaign. He's playing it safe. He's not attacking the president. He doesn't want to shake the can of bees. He just wants to glide himself into victory, and that's eventually going to be his downfall. So that's the Republican Party. We have the Democratic Party. Let's take a look a little quickly at the third wheels. So there now are two third parties, right? We have the Dixiecrats, which I mentioned before, which are segregationalists. They are fighting for Jim Crow and their way of life in the name of states' rights. And that used to be hardcore Democratic Party. And they are successful in not only in getting on the ballot in most of those southern states, but in four of those southern states, they actually take the claim of being the Democratic Party. And those are the four states they're going to win. They're going to win South Carolina, where Strom Thurmond was from, uh, the governor of Mississippi ran his is vice president. They're going to win Mississippi, and they're going to win Alabama, where Harry Truman wasn't even on the ballot, and they're going to win Louisiana. But those are the four states they won. And what their plan was was to capture that solid South and those electoral numbers, which constitutionally nobody would get a majority of the electoral votes needed. I think it was 266 back then. Um, he ended up with 303 taking it. But if they had gotten a couple more of those Southern states, then that would have been thrown into the House of Representatives where they saw themselves then as being bargaining chips where they could go to the Democrats and the Republicans and say, what are you going to do for us, the segregationists? And then we'll support your candidacy. And they felt, though, if uh, Thomas Dewey won, then they would come back in the Democratic Party as kind of the power brokers and run that Democratic Party and run out some of those liberals. But of course, that didn't happen. They ended up losing and they dissolved. But this is a clear example of dealignment. This is the beginning of the end for Democrats down in the South. And of course, they're going to realign with the Republican Party as we we get candidates like in 1960 and 68, Richard Nixon, 64, Goldwater. So let's talk really quickly about the Progressive Party. This is Henry Wallace. And Henry Wallace and a lot of people thought the Communist parties, the Pinkos and the Reds, were supporting the Progressives, who had very strong positions on racial equality. Henry Wallace toured the South. He got pelted with tomatoes, with you know garbage, because he was talking about integration and true civil rights and true equality. He's really 
ripping the Democratic Party apart from the liberal side. He thought that all of this negative attention with the Jim Crow stuff would garner him a lot of votes up in the North with Northern liberals. But of course, his campaign is gonna falter. Guru letters came out again. These were letters that he wrote about FDR and Churchill, who he called a fascist to a Russian mystic, and he was into New Age stuff, and it got a little bit kooky. This is just another example of the Democratic Party being pulled apart. On one side, they have the states' rights guys, kind of the more very conservative Democrats, and now they're dealing with these pinkos like Henry Wallace, and they're trying to find the middle ground. All right, guys, let's take a look at the campaign itself, and then we'll wrap her up. So Dewey plays it safe. He thinks he's going to win. Harry Truman is giving them hell, fighting against the 80th, and the poll numbers are slowly moving towards Harry Truman. There were a couple of things that happened in the news that are gonna help Harry Truman. Number one, the economy starts to rebound. So he becomes to look like the safer bet. And you also have the Berlin Airlift, which is a huge success in terms of containment in 1948. Henry Wallace and the progressives were fighting against kind of our Cold War strategy. And the Republicans weren't taking a very strong stand on what they thought of it. So these victories are gonna be victories for Harry Truman. Now, another huge element in this campaign is gonna be motion pictures. The candidates agree that they're gonna produce films that are gonna be shown in the last few weeks of the campaign at the movie theaters before the movies start, right? So Harry Truman does his on a shoestring budget using archive film, looking very presidential, being very straightforward, very folksy, um, very human in a sense. Thomas Dewey spent millions of dollars on his ad. It was very slick, and it just reinforced this image of him being kind of cold, being slick, being a kind of greasy politician, and it's going to backfire. Even though he spent more money, um, something like 10% of Dewey supporters are going to switch to Harry Truman, which looks like the safer bet at the last minute. Newsweek interviewed 50 political scientists. All 50 said Dewey was going to win. And when they went to bed that night, the returns were coming in, and Harry Truman was doing much better in those northern cities like Chicago and Philadelphia, and this was because of that civil rights plank. It's working. His numbers are huge. They're going up, and he's going to take the victory. The Chicago Tribune was so certain that Dewey was going to win, they printed the wrong title on the newspaper, and there we get that iconic photo of Harry Truman just laughing in everybody's face. So that's the election of 1948. Once again, if you take a look at it, it's really going to be the last time we're going to see third parties taking states. It happened in 1912 with the Bull Moose Party. Now it happens in 1948 with the Dixiecrats, but now we're really gonna be looking at the last Democratic victory for a little while as Ike comes to town real soon. And the swing states in this election are gonna be Ohio, Illinois, and California, and he's gonna squeak by in all three states. If Dewey took two of those three states, it would have been thrown to the House of Representatives. Truman wouldn't have got the 266 necessary. And if Dewey took all three, we'd be looking at a presidential administration, Thomas E. Dewey. So giddy up for the learning, guys. We hope you learned something about the 1948 election. If you haven't subscribed to Hip Use History, you can do that right now by clicking the big red button up on the screen. And if you haven't checked out the rest of the elections that we've done, you can check that box right there, which will take you off to the electoral playlist on Hip Use History. And of course, you can visit www.hiphuse.com and check out the video arsenal. You talk too much. I talk too much. There we go, guys. We'll see you next time that you press my buttons. And always remember, where attention goes, energy flows.